So as you might have seen, there's a um, little break in between the different sessions. Um, so we are going to um, have a um, half an hour uh, where I uh, get to set the stage for those of you in the room which have maybe never ever used a computational model. Um, in their professional or personal life. Um, um, but I also wanted to make sure that um, you uh, get to see some um, models that have been developed and might be um, in interesting uh, for your um, decision making. And then last not, but not least, I will also use um, part of this half an hour for setting the stage to uh, tell you more about how we have set up the conference and, and also uh, discuss some of the um, um, elements of um, the conference and how to uh, do the logistics um, perfectly here. So for um, the modeling of science and technology and innovation, as you might know, this is one of uh, 10 conferences and events that recently got funded by the Science of Science and Innovation Policy Program out of the National Science Foundation. Uh, it is an event that focuses on computational models. Most of the other events um, uh, focus on um, analytic um, um, models, but also among us um, on the communication of science to large um, audiences and general audiences. Just what uh, Dan Mode also mentioned that this is extremely important to make sure that uh, actually those which pay through their taxes um, for um, science technology developments and research, that they also get to benefit from it ultimately. But this uh, particular event is um, on computational models, predictive models. And I thought um, maybe I should make an argument for the utility and value of these models. And actually last um, Thursday, I went online and I tried to fi figure out what kind of nice, warm, sunny weather we might have while we are here. And unfortunately, it didn't work out this way. But and you now see the forecast from last Thursday. And those of you which might have checked the temperatures this morning might have realized some differences. So I think there are models which um, already work and which we are using on a daily uh, basis. Um, and to be honest, 30% um, of um, all industry in the US actually depend on the weather, um, be it transportation, construction, farming. So having these um, forecasts um, be uh, correct as po as correct as possible is very very um, uh, important. You might also be uh, familiar with um, some of the recent um, efforts by the CDC, the World Health Organization, and others around the globe to um, predict um, epidemics, but also then to ultimately um, um, decide on. Um, the most effective interventions. Here you see a, a map of the impact on, of air travel on the global spread of infectious diseases. As you might know, um, and that's shown in the top left, in former times, uh, diseases really traveled as fast as one person um, could travel on horse or by foot and it travels it traveled in waves and you have here uh, 14th century black death um, spreading over Europe in the top left um, corner. Uh, in today's um, time and age um, air flights um, are amazing ways to spread um, diseases. They are also good ways to spread ideas and uh, knowledge and um, experts but um, they are also um, spreading um, from one uh, major urban center to another to another um, highly populated urban centers, uh, certain diseases. And it's um, important to understand the effect of seasonality, of um, geographical aspects where um, these um, events um, happen, and also of uh, infectiousness and of different intervention patterns on um, containing diseases. And uh, in analogy, it's also very interesting for researchers to understand how um, ideas might spread depending on uh, when you uh, inject them into the stream of consciousness of researchers or social media, for instance. So there are some researchers which are very um, um, effective by um, having the results of speed, state, uh, uh, speed dating studies come, right up, come out right before Valentine's Day. And um, that um, definitely leads to more spreading then. But also there are other times when it's maybe not such a good idea to have a major uh, scientific um, uh, impact. Um, there are um, other sectors such as the energy sector which are very very interested in predicting for instance uh, peak oil. So this is um, another piece of work um, to look at the oil um, or the world oil production 
between 1859 and uh, 2050. And it's very, very important what kind of um, types of energy might become available, uh, when and um, how old technologies can be um, uh, left uh, behind and uh, replaced by more sustainable ways of energy harvesting. Um, here you see a, a prediction of seismic hazards, um, a map of the world with um, um, the probable um, ground um, acceleration uh, indicated by red for 100% um, hub probable and um, green for very unlikely. And um, you also get to see not only where um, major um, earthquakes might happen, and uh, that has major impacts also on building standards, so what kind of buildings are officially allowed to be built there. But you also get to see that there are some areas on our planet where we have very little data. And then here in this particular example, if you would zoom into uh, Japan, you would see a very, very high resolution of data and high density of sensors buried into the ground to actually capture um, what is happening in terms of um, seismic activity. Um, I would argue that um, in science, we also have some areas of science, some continents of science, where we have very high resolution data and we have beautiful data going way back in time. Uh, but we also have some areas of science where we have very, very little access to data. In general, models are used um, often in the construction of scientific theories as they um, facilitate to uh, make assumptions explicit. In fact, they force you to make these assumptions explicit. They um, help us to uh, describe and better understand the structure and dynamics of very complex, oftentimes multi-level uh, systems. Um, they help us to communicate and explain systems, and I do agree that we have to get better in not only showing formulas to um, general audiences, but um, other um, ways to, to communicate the results of these modeling efforts. Um, models also oftentimes um, help um, identify um, effective interventions. And last but not least, but also importantly, they help us to ask new questions. Um, there are different modeling approaches, and probably each one of you would have a different type of taxonomy that they could have um, listed here. But in general, um, I would personally distinguish, and I'm coming from uh, the science of science and um, policy uh, area, but also as an engineer again, um, I would distinguish qualitative versus quantitative models. Um, then, of course, there are deductive, abductive, or inductive mm -hmm. models. There are analytic models, and actually the field of um, science technology studies, for instance, is, is much more um, versed in uh, metrics and indicators and much less in predictive models. But I think that's why we have this conference, because we would like to focus more attention to the availability of big data, the av availability of computational models to actually predict uh, possible futures and uh, their likelihood. And that gives us a much better chance of actually picking desirable futures. And um, as uh, Dan Maud already mentioned, oftentimes these models are multi-level and they are multi-perspective. And you actually need uh, much data, not just the data we typically collect, but potentially also much more data on context and culture to um, have a positive uh, effect and to have models that really do make a difference. And when we um, um, selected speakers for this conference, we really tried to um, identify researchers in academia which um, develop models that cannot be only published in high-stake journals, but also uh, speakers that have gone the extra mile, or 10 miles, or 100 miles, that it takes to actually collaborate with um, science policy makers um, to make sure that the models that they are developing really have an effect on how these decisions are made. There are also different um, model types, and when I was looking through the different um, talks that will be presented here over the next two days, I think we have all of these different types covered. And um, you might um, like to add to this list also. It is interesting to understand that um, oftentimes uh, computational models are developed in other sciences, not necessarily science of science policy um, areas. And then, at some point or another, they are applied to the study of science itself. So epidemic models have been widely used to study the diffusion of um, knowledge and ideas. Uh, transportation models have been used to understand um, what a difference it makes if you now have a new career opportunity for young investigators. It's basically like putting down a new road which people can take and speed up because of the um, inflow of money. 
And then maybe they end up in an area they kind of wanted to be in, maybe not necessarily, but it's close enough that they're interested to take that uh, new bike road or that new highway to go from the current um, uh, career uh, point to um, a future career point. And then, of course, there are agent-based models, and we will hear uh, much about those um, in, in a number of talks. Now coming over to uh, models of science, technology, innovation. So here we do not use um, data on diseases or on uh, weather or on uh, seismic hazards, but instead we use qualitative and quantitative data of papers, patents, grants, jobs, news, um, and also more and more social media data to describe and predict um, likely structures and dynamics of the science, technology, innovation system itself. Um, these models are developed in many different areas of science and I actually would appreciate a show of hands um, of what kind of areas of science we actually have here in the room. So if you are an economist, if you could raise your arm and, and I guess that gives us about 10 economists right now, okay. Um, science policy, let's see how many we get there and they're more clustered but are also about 10. Um, social science. Okay, maybe 12, uh, very good. And of course, some might uh, raise their arm multiple times and we have had conferences, especially in network science, where you had um, people raise their arm 12 times for major areas of science. <laughs> um, Scientometrics, bibliometrics, so that's really an area where we are working extensively in, so that's another 10. Uh, information science, and I would have to raise my arm again, so that's maybe 15. Um, physics. So that's um, 10, definitely, maybe 12. Um, there's some smaller hands also. Um, what are the other domains which are present here, which I didn't mention yet? Engineering. <laughs> yes, engineering. <laughs> uh, mathematics. Um, anyone from mathematics? OK. Oh, yeah, Dame Wendy Hart just came in, mathematics. Um, um, any other domains which I have not listed here? And I apologize for the engineering. Okay, so psychiatry, of course. And that really gets to the cultural aspects also. Urban planning. Urban planning, very good. And I think we must have multiple in, in urban planning, yes. Architecture and visual art. Uh, epidemiology, wonderful. History. History, well, excellent. And? Biology. Biology. So it's actually difficult to. Um, agree on taxonomies of how we would even start talking about models. And I think that is something that will come out in the next days. But I think it's also fascinating to see how the different sciences actually uh, develop, um, implement, use, and also communicate modeling results. And so I'm, I'm very, looking, very much looking forward to this discussion. Thank you for the um, um, revealing what your background is. Um, fortunately, we are not um, doing this um, um, first, um, we are actually building extensively on prior work. Uh, many of you might be familiar with the Federal Research Roadmap for the Science of Science Policy. This is a document that came out in 2008, and I was actually rereading it yesterday on my way here. And many of these um, comments made there and these suggestions um, are extremely relevant and timely still today. So I, I recommend to those of you which haven't read it or haven't read it in a long time to revisit this. There's also the handbook um, of the science of science policy. And uh, Kai has been feeling she's going to join us tomorrow as well. And um, she and her uh, colleagues uh, did a marvelous job editing um, this work. So if you are not familiar with those two, I highly recommend those. In the uh, roadmap, um, there's also a listing of SISIP goals. And the goals are to establish a scientifically rigorous quantitative basis from which policymakers and researchers may assess the impact of the nation's scientific and engineering enterprise, improve uh, their understanding of its dynamics, and assess the likely outcomes. This is in this um, 2008 um, report, roadmap report, which is still the roadmap under which we are operating now. And then I thought I should show you some of the um, models that I find still uh, most fascinating. So models um, oftentimes come in mathematical form, in uh, statistical form. Uh, they might be computer simulations, or they might exist as artifacts. And here you have the so-called monetary national income analog computer. 
uh, developed um, by New Zealand economist and inventor Philip, uh, Bill Phillips, um, displayed at the London School of Economics in 1949. So uh, computers were not necessarily an option for this back then, especially if you want this kind of visualization happening um, it's, at the same time. Uh, it demonstrates a number of um, economic principles and it uses water tanks um, that represent households, business, government, and the exporting and importing sectors of the economy. And then it uses colored water that gets pumped around um, these um, system tubes um, to um, model um, the um, uh, economy and also uh, to measure income and spending and GDP. The system itself is programmable and cap capable of solving nine simultaneous equations in response to any change of the parameters. And um, I was wondering how many of you actually were aware of, of this particular model? It's one, two, wonderful, three, four. Um, so I um, was really fascinated to um, see um, this kind of analog um, computer um, to um, use to uh, implement this uh, particular model. And of course, modeling since then ha has advanced. And um, now we have um, computers to actually do some of the models. And um, one other model that I wanted to um, share with you is a model that um, Johan Bollen, one of my colleagues at um, IU, and uh, other colleagues of mine um, have um, recently had the pleasure to present to the European Commission, but also um, to the National Institutes of Health. And this is a model which um, argues for a new type of um, um, funding um, allocation um, model. And so here um, you see on the left-hand side how um, currently um, investigators uh, submit proposal. Then you have a, a set of reviewers on review panels which are reviewing those proposals. And then a certain percentage of um, the best proposals um, get funded. Um, on the right-hand side, you, need the, uh, you see the new model where each um, person acts as an uh, investigator and a reviewer at the same time. But um, the um, allocation of money is actually done in a quite different way. So here in this uh, new model, it's, which is based on the idea of um, the fund rank model that uh, is behind uh, Google's search engine, among others, um, in um, each year, the uh, funding agency or some agency or Congress would uh, deposit a fixed amount into each account of each of the uh, eligible um, researchers. Um, and um, you can actually um, take um, dollar amounts, and we will see this on the next slide, of how much um, money each one of them would have. But then um, that money, they have to give a certain percentage um, away to other um, researchers. And they could decide to give the money away to those um, which they believe will do um, excellent research, or to those which develop data sets or algorithms that they would like to use in their research, or to those which build infrastructure um, that is needed in that field of uh, research. Um, or they might use um, other criteria. Um, however, um, this way, um, the researchers, first of all, they have to communicate to each other their value and their contributions to science. Uh, and then um, scientists collectively assess each other's merit based on these different criteria. And um, they fund rank um, other scientists. Um, and that has as an effect that um, very highly ranking scientists, which get a lot of contributions by other peers, uh, actually basically become effectively uh, funding agencies because they will have to give away a lot of money in, in the next year. So if we do um, a concrete example, the uh, total funding budget in 2012, um, um, we can um, use that and divide it by the number of um, eligible researchers. And that um, results in about $100,000 per year. Um, if we set the fraction that has to be given away to 50%, then everybody has to give away uh, 50,000, but they can also keep 50,000. And uh, in 2013, then um, a scientist uh, receives that basic grant. He or she might get um, 200,000 from other peers, uh, resulting in a total, total of 300,000. With the 50% rate, 150,000 have to be given away, either to one or to multiple researchers. And um, then, um, they are done. So this could be an, of, uh, an, an uh, online portal that they log into once a year and uh, make these allocation decisions. So rather than submitting and reviewing propose, uh, project proposal, um, S would donate directly to the other scientists um, that um, then um, benefit from this, um, this funding. 
Now, um, we did a um, validation of this model um, using uh, publication data, in this case, from Thomson Reuters. And um, we are not arguing here that money should be giving away, given away according to how people cite each other, but we really use citations here as a proxy of how um, researchers might value each other's contribution. And um, if you do this, you actually get to see that um, ultimately the distributions you get um, with this um, fund rank model are very, very similar to the distributions you get um, of how this um, money is currently allocated. And in order to do the validation, we had actually had to do um, quite a bit of also name disambiguation um, across the two different databases, the funding databases and the Thomson Reuters um, publication database. So, um, if we then um, look at the efficiency of the system and uh, using uh, data from the um, Tolby survey of salary and the NSF um, foundation, um, then um, we have um, in this example here uh, four research professors working four weeks full time on a proposal submission. The labor costs are then about um, $35,000 with uh, success rates in computer science around 20%. Um, you have about five um, submission re re review uh, cycles um, to um, actually get the funding. And that results then in an expected labor cost of $175,000. The average grant um, in, at NSF uh, in this area is $156,000 per year. So, um, however, U.S. universities also charge um, indirect costs. Um, so you, the researchers actually at the end have $110,000 um, um, <coughs> available. So you actually get uh, a net loss um, with this uh, particular calculation. And um, you might argue that um, universities might um, like to even forbid some of the researchers to um, uh, engage in this um, activity to actually forego so much research time by submitting uh, proposals. But of course, currently, um, the system very much uh, encourages um, um, funding from uh, national agencies. And um, of course, the universities now, maybe more than ever, need also the indirect costs um, recovery. Um, so here, um, in this example, we did not um, yet discuss all the time that many of us uh, spent to uh, review those proposals. And um, ultimately, I think it would actually be interesting to discuss these kind of new approaches and to implement them maybe on a smaller scale and to test them in vivo and compare them in vivo with other models um, because they really provide an opportunity to um, for instance, get us to a point where researchers have to much more openly um, communicate um, their research, not only to other researchers, but also to general audiences. Because this is really what is, would be needed here in order for us to make uh, wise decisions in terms of funding allocation, because uh, proposals wouldn't be written here anymore. Um, I was also wanted to um, point out that industry um, is uh, using computational models um, quite extensively. Um, you might be familiar with the um, uh, true story, um, how um, Target started to send a teenager um, girl um, advertisements on um, uh, baby articles and, um, and um, baby food also. And um, her dad um, was very outraged about this, um, but then after a while when the store manager called him yet again to apologize, he actually had to uh, confess that um, there had been um, uh, events happening in his house that he hadn't been aware of and his um, daughter was actually pregnant. Um, you might also have seen the recent news um, that uh, Foursquare now accur accurately predicted uh, that Chipotle sale would plummet by 30% and they actually did. Um, so there is a lot of uh, computational modeling going on in industry and I assume many of you are also aware that um, Companies like Amazon and Netflix, they very much um, try to predict what you might like to watch next or purchase next. Um, many of the um, insurance agencies are uh, trying to track um, your um, um, income and other elements to understand if they should approve or not approve um, certain uh, types of policies or what the fee levels might be on your new car, uh, but also to um, provide incentives um, across different product lines. Um, so I'm very glad that we have about um, 15 representatives from industry here at the event and um, I'm looking forward to also learn more about how some of the models that are currently developed in academia can be scaled up to some of the data volumes that are very common in industry. 
Um, among the modeling challenges I see are um, model utility and usability. Um, sometimes it's, um, it's just okay to have a model that can be written up in a scientific paper, but I think it would be even more valuable to have models that can really be used and make a difference, a positive difference ideally, in the real world. There's also the issue of model credibility and model validation. Uh, model extendability and reproducibility, these are big issues, especially in a time and age when some of the sciences are under attacks that they cannot reproduce certain um, results. I think here we have an opportunity to actually get to a point that um, with more open data or well-known and uh, defined data and open code, we can actually get to a point in time when we can reproduce much of the modeling results um, we have. And then last but not least, uh, model sharing and uh, model retrieval. So how do we find the many different models that actually exist across the different sciences? So we already had a showing of hands for about um, eight different um, scientific fields here, most likely more. And um, it is very, very hard actually to find a kind of Craigslist-like marketplace that we all could use uh, to inform each other about what models exist, when they should be used, um, how they have been used, what impact they had, um, how uh, reliable they are, how, who validated them, etc. And um, that is also um, part of the discussion in tomorrow's panel on uh, data sets and algorithms. Uh, we also already mentioned that many models actually span multiple spatial-temporal scale, oftentimes with different dynamics. And it's very hard actually to uh, have models that really reach from the individual decision making. For instance, somebody decided on, deciding on a specific career trajectory um, and also take into account um, policy changes on the way or new funding opportunities that might come up at the uh, organizational level, just at the university level, or might come up uh, at the um, more global uh, system-wide level. And this interplay of the different scales, I think that's uh, very important to understand better. And uh, this background I have been using here is actually a map of um, scientific collaborations around the world. And as you all um, probably know, uh, science, but also um, technology and innovation, they are not um, local, they are very, very global. And we have not only expertise um, coming from Europe um, to, uh, to different places or from Asia or from the Americas or other places, but we also have uh, ideas and innovations uh, uh, taking long trajectories across our uh, scientific and across our geospatial landscapes. So there are a number of uh, modeling opportunities that I would like to mention here, um, including that we now do have um, a number of very high quality, high coverage interlinked data sets, maybe not yet covering culture, but uh, very much covering the um, scientific enterprise in terms of papers, patents, grants, and thanks to efforts uh, out of uh, the National Institutes of Health, more and more data sets are also interlinked. So funding is now linked to uh, patents, is now linked to publications, and other agencies are um, um, also aiming to uh, interlink their data sets better. Um, we have more cost-effective storage and computation, so we actually can take on very large-scale data sets and uh, run um, computational algorithms. Um, we have validated scalable algorithms, and we also have more advanced visualization and animation capabilities. So I wanted to um, um, show you one of the uh, science forecasts that we have been uh, prototyping at Indiana University. And this is really a way to, um, just like for um, weather forecasts, where you have a moderator walking you through today's weather, you now have um, also the ability to use um, human experts um, to walk you through developments in science um, and technology. And um, let me go over to um, that part. Um, and I hope the audio is um, going to work here. Mm -hmm. Welcome to Season 1, Episode 1 of Science Forecast, broadcast directly out of Indiana University here in Bloomington, Indiana. Today, we're taking a look at a map of the world overlaid with global scientific collaboration patterns. Every time two researchers collaborate, it creates a lake. The more collaboration between these two researchers, the thicker that link becomes. We can see this density in the U.S., Europe, and Asia. Let's take a deeper look into the United States. We can see this densification along the west coast. A lot of here along the east coast we have Chicago and here we are in Bloomington, Indiana. Let's zoom back out, take a look at activity in Europe. Fueled by the European Union and other funding, many researchers are collaborating across countries and across different disciplines, creating a lot of activity here. 
Let's take a look at a different data set. This time we're looking at Twitter, still looking at Europe. Each dot is a tweet and the colors represent different languages. We can see in the Netherlands we have light blue for Dutch. Other major urban areas include Paris, London, Madrid, Berlin. A lot of activity in those areas. Our guest in studio today is Johan Bolin. He's using this global Twitter data from you and from me, our friends and family, and people all around the world to predict human behavior. Let's see what he has to say. You can actually look at an individual and see what that individual is experiencing in terms of of ups or downs in terms of exactly health. yeah that's kind of the idea I mean that's what this graph shows it's essentially a user that at one point in time on Twitter publicly announced that they were had been diagnosed with bipolar disorder right. then our computers picked that up we took the Twitter handle downloaded the all of the tweets that that individual had submitted to Twitter over the past uh, two or three years and then our computers went to work looking at every single tweet looking for indications of uh, a particular psychological mood state that was evinced by the wording of that tweet and then you can chart that over time you end up with a timeline like this where you can clearly see that this individual went through episodes where their their mood was a lot more manic and had much greater variance and then very silent periods where presumably they might have been more depressed interesting isn't it maybe one day there'll be an app for all of this it might change when and what you tweet this is a map of science where continents are not America, Europe, Asia. Instead, they're disciplines of science. We have math and physics in purple, medical specialties in red, and social sciences in yellow. <coughs> you can see the overlap between all these different disciplines. And the push and pull is created when new links are generated between the different disciplines. Let's zoom in now on medical specialties. Just heard our guest, Johan Bolin, talk about mental disease. And it is found in this medical specialties area. Next time on the Science Forecast, we're going to talk about the funding and the research in this area. Stay tuned. Thanks for joining us today. So um, I think this conference is also a, a very good opportunity for all of us um, to um, learn more about each other's challenges and to ultimately um, help bridge that gap between what's happening in, in academia, in industry, but also in, um, in government um, much better. Um, very quick, I think you have seen the agenda. You have it also in your um, uh, binders. Um, we have uh, very little time in between the uh, different elements, um, but um, we have, and I wanted to point out um, that there is the reception this evening. Uh, also during the reception, there will be a tour of the Sentient Chamber, which is a living architecture in installation by um, Philip Beasley, and he actually is uh, joining us here also. Um, so there will be um, um, s some special events surrounding um, the reception as well. And um, we have um, two keynotes, um, one by Sandy Pendland today and one by uh, Dame Wendy Hall uh, tomorrow. Um, in terms of logistics, um, I think you have seen where the um, uh, emergency exits are in case there is um, an emergency. I think um, the restrooms are right across the uh, hallway. Um, I wanted to make sure that everybody is uh, aware that all the talks and uh, Q&A are recorded and they will become available online. I do hope that uh, mishaps like what I just had can be cut out, <laughs> please. Um, and then um, all the speakers, please do share your slides with uh, Dan O'Donnell. And I think you have met him, if you could uh, quickly uh, raise your arm, yes. And um, we also would like you to sign the copyright form, otherwise we cannot make them available online. Um, there will be... Um, a group photo and um, we also plan to photograph um, the panels and so Andreas Bückler is our professional photographer I think you have already seen him in action um, for the internet um, just visitor will uh, get you online and uh, if you use social media uh, and please do use um, them then uh, we have the hashtag mod STI um, we have uh, a number of sign-up sheets uh, for those of you which want to um, see the um, most complex but also most uh, emotionally enticing living architecture. Um, so please um, find them out, outside, just where you picked up the binders. Uh, we also try to get reservations for nearby restaurants for this evening. I'm uh, aware that this is graduation week, so apparently all the hotels and all the restaurants are completely booked, but um, we will try our best there. So please watch out for these sign-up sheets. Um, on behalf of all the organizers, I would like to thank you for coming here. If you have any questions or comments also, please feel free to contact any of us. And um, as you see, also local organizer Dan O'Donnell, without him, we couldn't have done this all. So um, please um, tell him also um, 
your appreciation, but also let him know if there's something that we should be doing. Uh, last but not least, I would like to um, thank all of the support supporters of the conference. As you know, it is an NSF-funded event, but um, it was actually um, the enormous interest by many um, that um, let us um, go outside and try to find additional funding so, so that we can um, have a nice event for many more than 30 speakers that we had initially anticipated. So um, with this, I'm um, going to... Um, Guide over to the panel. I believe there is no break, but I think we will have three, four minutes if you would like to uh, get something to drink or to, um, um, I think you can't maybe bring in food here. Um, then please do so while we are setting up the panel. Thank you all.